people. This so, conference will now be recorded. There we go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Claudia Holland, and I'm chief of the Bureau of Library Development and the Division of Library and Information Services. It's really great to have y'all uh, dropping in today on a Monday morning. Uh, I realize Monday mornings are kind of busy, but sometimes it's a good way to get started just to just to talk and see friends and people you haven't met yet, but are interested in, in learning what they're doing. Uh, this is a continuation of our series of open Okay, somehow I got muted. I didn't touch it, I promise. Uh, anyway, this is, we're continuing our conversations um, uh, for library staff from libraries throughout Florida. Doesn't matter what type of library, I'm just glad to have you. We hope that uh, on these calls, you'll feel comfortable sharing your ideas, your concerns, your plans, frustrations, successes, whatever you would like to share. We're really focusing today on uh, uh, something different, but before I get started with that, I, I want to mention a couple of housekeeping items before um, we really sort of launch on our discussion. We've muted everyone at this point, um, but once we uh, start the discussion, we'll unmute you. You feel free to mute yourselves until you're ready to speak. Um, I'm really hoping people will feel comfortable in talking. Uh, the chat is available to you. However, if you do not have a mic or you feel more comfortable uh, writing a note in chat, we'll be monitoring it uh, and read your questions out if you would like or even your comments. Um, if you get dropped if you're, or you're having bandwidth issues, just try to log back in or if you have your webcam cam on, you could certainly turn it off until you want to speak. Uh, you may, of course, speak without your webcam on. Uh, in fact, I hope that you will. Uh, we'd love to hear your voices and, and love to see you too, uh, especially in these days of, of really not being visually connected the way we would perhaps like to be. This session will be recorded and made available on the BLD's YouTube channel. For you and for anyone who might be interested and, and, uh, and are unable to join us today. So like I said, we've shifted our focus. Uh, we can certainly talk about um, plans to reopen or uh, any issues that have to do with um, how your library and how you are coping with the pandemic. Um, but we really decided that we wanted to focus more uh, on something more targeted today. So we, we thought that uh, adult programming would be uh, a good launching point um, to start talking about how we're shifting services uh, and programming to a completely, almost, probably almost completely virtual environment. Um, to some degree, of course, there is overlap between young adult, adult, maybe even children's programs. Um, but I think we want to try and, and really kind of focus on those groups of people who um, may have targeted needs, may um, uh, be joining us uh, in the library virtually for a, a specific reason or just to be entertained. Um, who knows really what people are interested in, and that's what it's our job to find out what it is they're interested in, of course. Um, I think the hardest part with, and, and you all correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, but the hardest part of reaching out to adults is the extremely wide variety of uh, options that are available to us in terms of topics and perhaps even platforms and how we deliver services to uh, adults. Um, you may want to target specific age groups. You may want to target specific sort of maturity groups if you want to call, call us, us that. Um, you may want to target specific gender groups. For example, I was thinking about this earlier. Um, I uh, 
had the, the great um, pleasure to be involved with a library that was offering uh, a book club for adolescent young men and their dads. And it was extremely successful um, from the standpoint of they did in fact have people coming into the library, but that's an option too that you might want to explore. Uh, as you know, I'm, I mean, I'm sure that, uh, you know, as you're planning adult services, you're looking for all kinds of things on the web. Um, so I'm probably not going to tell you anything new today in terms of where to look, uh, but I hope that you'll share where you've been looking and what's been specifically successful for you. Uh, some of the places that I'm familiar with include, of course, PLA. Um, that's, that's a no-brainer pretty much. Uh, the Five Minute Librarian is an opportunity to, to, to explore the Programming Librarian, Librarian to Librarian, Library Thing, et cetera. All of these um, uh, websites or blogs uh, offer some uh, uh, interesting, innovative, and tried and true ideas for you. You may also want to check out what's available on Web Junction. Um, the Florida Library webinars, and of course, the MLCs, the multi-type library cooperatives, offer all kinds of training. All of these are available to you free, um, so please explore those. And of course, your LibGuides yourselves, whatever you're producing, I'm assuming you're sharing that with your colleagues throughout the state. Uh, Casey, uh, are you on with us today? I am. Um, you also had a question from Darlene, which, good morning, Darlene. Um, do you know which library was offering the teen and dad book club? I do. It's not in Florida. It was in uh, Virginia where I used to work, uh, but I can certainly connect you with the people who were doing that. Um, actually, it was a uh, as I recall, it was a uh, paraprofessional who was leading that effort. He was a male. He was also of color. And it was, uh, you know, to have a male who was leading that was really um, impactful. Uh, so I can certainly find out if they are still doing that, uh, providing that um, opportunity even virtually now. Casey, would you um, would would you also share what you were, you had uh, recently watched a webinar that was particularly impactful for you? Would you share that? Yeah. So, as somebody whose primary focus has always been kids and teens, um, I realized that I had never really taken any sort of formal training about adult learners. Um, and I came across one that Seth Lynn recently did called Creating Digital Arts Lesson Plan for Library Patrons. Um, and I, I can link that in the, in the, in the chat as well. Um, but it was just really fascinating because uh, Seth Lynn partnered with Marlon out of Miami-Dade. Um, and he actually walked through creating sort of a formal plan for programming, but he also went into a lot about um, just adult learners in general. Um, and I know one thing that was really fascinating to me was that, um, you know, he brought up that the thing with adult learners, when they attend some kind of a program or a class or a webinar or what have you, was that they are typically coming with a problem that they hope will be solved. Um, and so, you know, if they're coming to a tech related program, they're coming because they have something that wants to be solved. And, you know, it could be as simple as, I don't know how to crochet, I wanna learn how to crochet. Um, so I threw that link in the chat if anybody's interested. It was really well done. Great, thank you, Casey. Have others seen some uh, great webinars or, you know, anything that was particularly helpful to you? Sometimes even looking at stuff on Pinterest um, is really helpful. Feel free to unmute yourself and speak out.
I think I would consider too, if I have, I think I have a couple of people here from uh, college settings, keep in mind that these ideas are also transferable to students. Students are, you know, of course, interested in the academic um, assistance that they get and, and receive uh, from, from libraries uh, at their institutions, but they're also looking for things to do on their off time or just to get away from, uh, from sort of the pressures, I guess you would say, of, of attending uh, college. Um, so keep that in mind as well when you're uh, exploring what you can do for your students. I, I had worked in a couple of places that were, and I come from a largely an academic background, but have also worked in public libraries. And some of the people I worked for were very averse to combining sort of a public library approach to conducting uh, or providing services in a college setting. And I thought that was really too bad um, that, that that was the approach because uh, we have so much that we can learn from each other in terms of uh, providing services that are um, and programs that are meaningful to um, our students on campuses. Hi, Claudia, this, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, this is Regina Burgess with Plan, and I'm going to put in the chat box um, a link to a webinar recording that we uh, escaping ordinary instruction using escape rooms to get students thinking critically and creatively. And uh, we had a, a couple of librarians from Florida State University present this for us. So this could give you some ideas on, um, you know, escape rooms for, uh, you know, even teens or, or young adults. Great. Thank you so much. I see that Darlene has a good uh, suggestion too. PBS POV film series for educational documentaries and discussions. Does anyone else have anything that they want to share that is, you know, could kind of overlap with um, students, with your academic colleagues or vice versa? And Darlene, I'm curious, um, are you all doing that virtually or is the plan to do that face to face? Um, so typically um, outside of COVID-19, we do that face to face. Um, and then, you know, some libraries take it to another level and they bring in a, a professor who can actually comment on that specific topic and provide a discussion follow up after the film. Um, but now with coronavirus, POV is actually offering streaming. Um, so we're going to try to do that. And we could eventually um, bring in a, a professor via Zoom or, you know, via virtual chat and, and, and provide the option for just a virtual chat after the film. I think that's a great idea. Sort of like a you know, that could be like a virtual OSHER or, you know, continuing education uh, uh, offering for a variety of topics, uh, including travel or, um, like you said, uh, using the PBS films as to sort of spark that conversation, but collaborating with um, your local university or even Obviously, it doesn't have to be local. It could be anywhere. It could be anyone you know, anywhere, if they're willing to, to do it. <laughs> be nice if they were willing to do it for free, but in the event they aren't, perhaps you have uh, some money set aside specifically for programs like this. So what, what share your favorite um, website or blog. Pinterest page, what Facebook account, I mean, not personals, but, you know, ideas of places to look that have been successful for you as you've uh, been planning for adult programming.
Hey, Robert here from Pasco. Hey, um, Robert. Hello. Nothing real specific, but um, I just steal from other library systems. Like you can just go on their event calendars and kind of poke around. Um, you know, some of the major big public libraries, Hillsboro, Orlando, uh, ourselves. Just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I like to see what other people are doing and. If there's something real interesting, contact them directly and kind of see what they thought of it, how it went, et cetera. Uh huh. Was there one in particular that you did that you, you know, you were interested in, and then you explored it, or you, or you're in the process of doing so? Um, nothing in too particular that sticks out in my mind at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. This escape room thing is really, I don't know anything about escape rooms, I'm afraid to say. So yeah. have, others, have others tried those? Have you tried that, Robert? Yeah, one of our branches did a Minecraft escape room. Um, okay. We were actually contacted by some other library system about sharing it. And we're like, yeah, of course, please do. Like, <laughs> Great. Uh, I, that one was through uh, Google Docs, if I remember. I think that's where everybody's kind of trying to make them. And I can throw the link in the little chat. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Anybody else? Any blogs that have been particularly interesting on, you know, for adult programming? I tend to go to blogs myself, but Casey, can you think of any Facebook um, places that you've explored? Uh, most of the most of the Facebook places that I tend to frequent are usually geared more towards kids and teens. Um, I do know, and may I think it was maybe Nephlin. Uh huh. I could be wrong. I know when libraries first started shutting down, they were sh either sharing or hosting, um, like a I think it was like red sneakers yoga or something to that effect. But they were doing um, like a live workout for older adults. Uh huh. Um. So I don't because I know that there are a lot of libraries who will do like a silver sneakers program in their library or things yeah. like that. So has anybody done anything similarly to that? Or any program over the over the summer geared towards adults? You said adult programming? Yeah. Uh, we've you... done um virtual what, what's it called yin yoga i think it is mm. and that was pretty popular uh-huh have you thought about taking that virtually too it is virtual oh it is virtual yep would you share that <laughs> I'd oh be sure yeah let me find it that. <laughs> darlene i think you were going to say something um, we've partnered with, we've always partnered with our local Hispanics in Action group who provides free language classes um, where they, you know, in person. And so they've turned those over to virtual um, with a, with a, a volunteer teacher. And so there's, we're offering French, Italian, Spanish, um, and then we always do English as a second language. Mm -hmm. uh, but those tend to be pretty popular. And then we did um, we did some book discussions virtually. Uh-huh. How did that go for you, the book discussions? Those were popular. Those were actually hosted by our collections manager who typically holds a, a monthly book swap. Um, and she just wanted to make sure that she was available for the book swap group where they could meet virtually and um, it, it sounded like it was pretty well attended and they'd like to continue it if we have enough staff to do it. Great. Yeah. So have y'all thought about reaching out to um, 
shut-ins, nursing home residents, people who, you know, are really, um, you know, who need programs that are designed specifically to, to those who may be have, have suffering from, you know, minor dementia through advanced dementia, Alzheimer's, and or they have limited, you know, physical mobility. Um, has anyone done any kind of thing like that? I was looking at this wonderful site called musicandmemory.org um, that talks about downloading music onto an iPod. Yes, an iPod. <laughs> and then sharing those with um, individuals in uh, um, nursing homes. Of course, that costs money. Uh, but it may be that there's another way to create uh, like a channel for someone who uh, has um, access to uh, a computer, you know, so that they can listen to music. And, and the benefit of music for uh, people is so dramatic, particularly those who are so inwardly focused. Um, that it, it's worth considering uh, looking into those um, classes. Uh, virtual exercise, for sure. I think that would be popular for just about anyone who, particularly if you are, um, you know, in an area where you're still home, you know, staying home a lot. Um, lifetime arts isn't for seniors. Art education, that's another opportunity um, that you may want to explore. Um, places like that, have have you thought about reaching out to that community virtually? I know that's a little harder. You're going to have to partner, obviously, with whoever is in charge of um, some sort of computer um, capability in those facilities. Kelly also wrote in the chat that um, she tapped into their presenter database and found some who are able to offer them video presentations. Some, who, who's that, Kelly? Some of their presenters. But on what, what kinds of topics? Okay. She said Moffitt Health, Yoga. Great. Yeah, I would think that health issues would be a very popular um, topic. Yoga is more meditation, yeah. That's great. What do you think are the biggest challenges to, to a, you know, reaching out to this group or to attracting this group, these groups, I should say. It's not one. <laughs> so getting the word out for sure, Darlene. Um, how are you marketing? How are people marketing these programs to particularly individuals who um, are in that sort of area of not having access to uh, online sources. So Kelly says they're posting on Facebook. Okay, yeah, that seems to be a popular, you know, good place to, to get the word out. Do people still do flyers, like the old fashioned kinds of things, you know, putting it, uh, you know, up in areas like at grocery stores or somewhere, maybe that's old fashioned, but, <laughs> uh, you know, things like that, reaching those people who may not necessarily um, frequent the library. Darlene says they're also using constant contact and Facebook.
What do you find to be the most successful for getting the word out? Oh, that's a good idea. Kelly says, and Kelly, where, what library are you with? I'm sorry. Uh, our our self-checkout has a summary of events. That's good. Plant City. Great. Thanks, Kelly. I know we shove flyers in the, the curbside pickups. Uh-huh. That's a good idea. Anybody else have a particularly a particular method that seems to work with, you know, maybe a specific um, group, community group? What kinds of partnerships are you developing? I think there was a mention earlier. Let me see. about partnering with someone. I think Darlene had said that they were, had partnered with someone local, but obviously partners are critical, I would think, to getting the word out and to helping provide programs that are um, diverse to your communities. Does anyone have um, active um, job seeker assistance? I can envision that being continuing to be heavily used. One of our partners, our local partners is providing career counseling. And mm -hmm. so we're trying to um, just let people know that they can use them for career counseling rather than us, you know, uh -huh. compete for that service. But they're, they have their counselors on, um, on site at their premise, but they're only providing virtual career counseling. I see. So do they sign up for an appointment? Is that how it works generally? It's an yep. It's an appointment based yeah. program. Is that free? Darling? It is free, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do others have um, ideas on job seekers? I know that the LibWorks, I think, is very active in uh, working, I think, with Grow with Google. I might be completely wrong, but uh, they're working with groups on creating assistance with um, uh, job seeking. Uh, because I, I, you know, I, I think we would all agree that that's gonna be a pretty critical uh, service to, to support. So we know that marketing is is a kind of a challenge. Um, I know that some of you are open back up uh, to some degree to your communities. Um, I don't know if you're continuing to do like um, just book displays or anything like that. Um, Do you happen to have relationships with local authors? Uh, and, you know, have, I, I would think that would be a huge appeal it is to me as an adult to um, be able to, uh, you know, attend a virtual session 
with an author. And I don't even care if it's an author, I don't know. If, it, <laughs> if it's something that I'm interested in, I'm, I'm going to attend it. It may be that journaling is is a of interest to people during this time. Um, that can be a very expressive way of kind of handling um, challenges, personal challenges, uh, and um, anyway. So uh, so we could have people on writing how to journal, how to. Uh, it, it could be a, a, an author, it could be someone who's just specifically deals with, with journaling. Kelly said we are working on a potential virtual author meet. Kelly, do you want to share sort of how your, what your approach has been to reaching out and kind of how you see that mm -hmm. operating once you can get it set up? I think that uh, another big draw here um, in, in some of the webinars that we provided uh, through the division have been uh, genealogy um, uh, webinars and archives and uh, digitizing and these kinds of things like how do you take care of your personal papers and those kinds of things. Um, I see that Katrina is on the call with us. Maybe she could speak a little bit to the other kinds of um, uh, resources that we have that have been particularly popular for um, adult learners. Hey there, Katrina. <laughs> hey, this is Katrina. I just got myself unmuted. Um, I don't know how to narrow that down. Can you help me? We have a lot of stuff. Can Can you help me narrow that question down a little? Sure. Um, so uh, just to give everybody background on Katrina, one of the things, she's our um, education uh, expert uh, for the division. And so she does a lot of uh, work on uh, uh, identifying resources and compiling them and Katrina, feel free to tell me I've got this all wrong, but compiling these resources into um, primary source sets for students. Um, but she uh, also has um, been working with others on doing a genealogy uh, or uh, providing, you know, gathering resources on genealogy and uh, also, you know, I think there are people who are working, um, I don't know, you, you tell me, Katrina, what, what is the most appealing to you in terms of the uh, draw for adult learners probably to our resources that we make available through Florida Memory and DPLA, the Digital Public Library of America? Uh, sure. Um, so I can go in a couple of different directions. First of all, I have to, to make this with the caveat that we recently updated the Florida Memory website software, um, which meant that our old plugin for how the search worked doesn't work anymore and we're having to um, install something new. So right at the moment, everything's running really slowly for searching. We, we hope to have that uh, fixed. Uh, very soon, I hope, but but right now um, it, it's a little more difficult to search than it normally is. Um, so we do have um, resources for for genealogy, whether those are um, the photographic collection is always a great resource for learning about your own town. Um, 
if I have a room full of, say, 30 people, I'd say any time I do a presentation, at least one person will find something. If, if, if we have people from Florida, we'll find something um, just relating to their family um, or, or somebody that they know in the photo collection, which is really fun. Um, then we have other textual collections like the um, World War I service cards that can be really useful. Um, you can search them by your community or by name and find out who in your community served. Um, various collections on the collection page. We have a something that's gotten a lot of involvement with folks that have a little bit of downtime now that Josh is doing, as he has uh, what he calls his digital volunteers. And those are people that are helping to transcribe records that we have online. And, and that has been amazing, the involvement we've gotten and how um, uh, useful that is. Josh will assign um, pages to different collections that need transcribing and people are doing that, you know, page at a time on their own time. And that's both really valuable for the whole state of Florida. They're giving something that everybody can use. But when people um, transcribe a document, they really get to know it in, a, in an intimate way. So that's it's a fun learning experience too. So I count that as, as both those kind of things. Um, my personal favorite um, some of the materials um, would be in our audio collection, and my favorite of that is the Zora Neale Hurston WPA recordings. Um, of course, everybody knows uh, Zora Neale Hurston is the author of uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God. During the WPA, um, during the Depression, she also worked for the uh, Federal Writers Project in Florida, and it wasn't something that she talked about during her lifetime, or a lot of other to uh, authors talked about their work with the WPA, um, some they were sometimes embarrassed about it, considered it like being on welfare. So even though it was an important part of the history that she contributed to the state, um, it's not something that necessarily um, everybody's familiar with. But she uh, went around Florida um, recording different kinds of work songs. Um, some of my favorites are the songs that the men, usually African-American men, working on the railroads that they would sing while they were working on the railroads to help them, you know, these are very heavy things that they're lifting and moving. And of course, so that requires a great deal of coordination and timing. And so they have uh, different songs that they would sing in different rhythms to help them keep the rhythm, rhythm together. And hearing Zora Neale Hurston singing those songs and talking about how she collected the folk life and, and calling out individual names of people that worked on the railroads, which is not uh, something that's been retained in our history very often, and to hear that history made so real through her voice um, is one of my favorite things. And I'll push that out in the chat, and I'm um, happy to answer any other questions. Thank you so much, Katrina. That's wonderful. And are, is Josh still taking volunteers? Uh, I believe that he is, yes. Okay, so if people are interested in learning more about their uh, volunteer program, just uh, let let me know and I will uh, get you hooked up with Josh or you can just go, is, is there a, uh, something on the website, on your website, archives website, Katrina, about that? Uh, let me look for that and if I find that, I will also push that in, out in chat. Great, thank you. And thanks for the tip too about um, about Florida memory. Um, we, like Katrina said, we have a new interface. And as you know, things uh, tend to um, have to be tweaked when you have something new. Um, so it is a fabulous resource. And we hope that you will take a look at everything that's offered on that site, just for ideas. You may come up with your own ideas on how to use content that is in, uh, um, uh, the Florida Memory site, as well as DPLA and uh, the um, Sunshine State Digital Network, um, which is a hub for DPLA. Uh, there's all kinds of content. You can probably get lost. There's so much content out there, but you know your community best. So you know, I would assume, what will appeal to them um, and just finding something, you know, that uh, let's say perhaps you wanted to explore doing something about genealogy or local history, community history. People could join you with 
their pictures if they have uh, the ability to share, um, uh, you know, to to take a picture or to have a webcam or something like that or use their phone and can share their pictures with you uh, or with a group of people who are interested in, in learning more about local history. Um, and just to backtrack a little, um, Kelly did get back with us on the author author thing, and she said that um, they registered through their virtual book club with Novel Network so that they can host the author. Um, I asked her if there was a fee or a cost associated, and she said, our membership does not have a cost. I think there are different membership levels, and she posted that link in the chat. Great, thank you. Claudia, I forgot to mention probably the, the most obvious um, that Josh and I are both available to do uh, virtual programming online for, for libraries and communities um, on different awesome. topics or on Florida memory. So just to throw out that out there as well. Okay, you may get a lot of calls. <laughs> thank you, Katrina, for, for reminding us of that. Um, and I see too that you posted the information about how to be a volunteer. Um, that could be something that would be really interesting to a, a wide variety of people throughout the state. Um, yeah, and they can contact y'all to see if, if, they, if they have any questions, yeah. Any other thoughts on, on interesting approaches and keep in mind too we have an incredible sound archives like Katrina was referring to and we have a, a, a radio station a web radio station um, that you can listen to Florida folk music on has anybody done live trivia as a as a program Renee says that she has, they have in Sarasota. Yeah, we did in Pasco too. I don't remember the exact topic. I'd have to find it. It was either Harry Potter or Marvel superhero, you know, something like that. <laughs> okay. So that's can, can, can someone share sort of how you all set that up, what platform you used and how you got the word out? And was it well attended? The one I was thinking of is Harry Potter, and it's on Friday, July 31st. Looks like Regency Park Library is doing it virtually through Zoom. No idea what attendance will be like, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I mean, it's Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've already got that going for you. Yeah, really. I think we're waiting for someone to do it on Hamilton, right? <laughs> so how yeah, would you? Yeah, friends of the library wanted us to show Hamilton like virtually somehow, and I was like, "Oh man, the licensing <laughs> fees must be outrageous, even if they would allow it." <laughs> oh You'd probably have to mortgage one of your branches. <laughs> yeah, because I think I remember reading Disney paid like 75 million for the rights for Disney Plus or something like that. So yeah, I'm like, I think it's going to be a little more than what we can afford. Yeah, I thought the seven dollars I paid was well worth it <laughs> to, to have the month for Disney Channel, you know. And Renee said that they use Kahoot for their their Kahoot. life trivia's. So do many people use that for adults? Uh, I hear that there's, you know, I mean, Harry Potter to me is, could be an adult program too, but it's kind of an age, uh, non-age, well, to some degree age specific, but um, what if you did that for adults? What would that look like? 
what other games can you offer virtually that might appeal to an older adults set? Renee said, Kahoot is fairly affordable as we get a special rate. It was less than $500 annually. Our program is for adults. It's run like a regular trivia night. Okay. And I do know that Kahoot has a free option, but of course there, there are limits to that. Darlene said Dungeons and Dragons. Darlene, do you want to share sort of your setup for that and how you all make that work? So we have, um, it, it's actually more for teens. Um, but the, it, the platform that we use, I have to find it from the children's librarians that are using it, um, but it is for 13 and up only. Um, and we've had it where we meet on a weekly basis. Um, we did two different branches um, who did it virtually. And we did not get the amount of teens that we were hoping, um, but when I talked about it to some of my adult friends, they were saying, oh, I would totally do that. So it is, it, it's not something I think that our adult um, programmers um, have knowledge in, but we could certainly see if um, there's a way that they could teach, you know, the children's librarians could teach some of the adult programmers or um, figure out a way that we could make it work for adults. Great. But typically there's, you know, the children's librarian is the um, is the host and then they're the ones who um, develop the game and then they're the ones that basically monitor everything. Mm -hmm. I see you use Trivia Maker. Is that a, a do you find that an easy platform to use? Yes, the Trivia Maker is um, rather easy to use, and you can just develop it, develop it in advance, and then um, and then use it during the session. Uh huh. Great, thank you, Darlene. I know that some people are doing uh, outreach to to prison uh, populations. Um, is there anyone on the call today who is reaching out to prison populations? Okay. Um, what What is your dream to offer if you could offer it? Even if it were face-to-face, -face, let's just say we're dreaming with it being face-to-face -face and you have an unlimited budget. <laughs> what would you like to offer? I think we need to get a SpaceX in here to like make us a rocket or show <laughs> show us how to make rocket. <laughs> okay, that's a that's a big dream. I like that. How could you take that virtually? Well, that's not too hard. You just get one of their engineers or scientists, right? They, they should know how to use Zoom or something and kind of present on that. <laughs> uh-huh, you would think. Uh, now, we had um, a NASA at your library. I think several of you may have attended or participated in that last year, I think it was, Casey. Is that right? What year is it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was two years yes, ago. It was, it was last January for last summer's theme. Yeah, and what uh, that that wasn't all virtual. I know that, but is it something that could be taken virtual? Um, I mean, I think any programming with the right amount of creativity and flexibility could be moved to a virtual setting. And and I think if nothing else, Florida summer reading programs have proven that this year. Um, but yeah, I mean, they definitely have all sorts of educational resources um, online that one can pull from. There's also something called Skype with a scientist, 
um, that is a free program. And I think it's probably primarily aimed towards kids and teens, but you may be able to get them set up for an adult program. Um, but they actually have it so that you can um, request a scientist to come do a, a Skype session, either one-on-one -on -one or with a group. Um, and you can sort of focus it on certain topics. So if you wanted somebody to focus on, um, you know, space science <laughs> and all that that implies, um, that is another, another option. And they've been just, um, I know they've also been scheduling scientists just to do them um, regularly with different topics. So that's just another added resource. All right. Thank you. So something that we do annually, um, which I plan that we'll hopefully be able to move it virtually this year is we have a, a lecture series, which is all based on our local waterways because it's such a huge topic um, in South Florida. And we um, host it usually like every other Monday evening, and we usually get around two, 250 people. Wow. Um, but it's the the topics are based on like blue green algae and um, you know sea um, sea level rise, and um, we usually get some local scientists that come in or professors um, that are able to answer some of the questions that our library patrons or the community have um, and it's it, it runs about an hour and 15 minutes and sometimes there's even local authors who have written on the topic that will come in um, but i really hope that we'll be able to continue that this year and and have it as a virtual series that's wonderful thank you darlene Anybody else have something they want to share or dream about? Kelly put in the chat, art and music education. That's what you dream about, Kelly, or is that what you are already providing? Okay, she's dreaming about it. <laughs> what about art and music education? She's probably typing away. Okay, so she'd love to teach guitar or basic sketching. Great. And you could probably do that too with, you know, a virtual environment. Um, so let me ask you too, if you are open to the public uh, and you, you know, had a room that you could offer something like sketching or guitar, um, I assume you would you would just practice social distancing. Um, is that something that is going to be allowed by your uh, local um, governing authority or your your direct you know your library director, uh, whatever? Um, is that even an option for you? I guess it's that's a I'm not quite sure yet <laughs> what's going to happen. So I, I get it. Um, we have about five minutes left, and I uh, if you know if someone doesn't have something they want to just jump in before we we log off. There were a couple of things I wanted to share with you. Uh, one is that the uh, DLIS Florida Care, Cares Act funding was announced last week. Um, the application period is now open. It's going to be a pretty pretty short turnaround. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact us. Um, there's a lot of good information on our website as well. Uh, we hope that you will consider applying. Um, and 
you know, we're, we're here to help you in any way we can. So uh, let us know if you do have any questions. Um, Casey, would you, thanks Darlene. Casey, would you put up the um, website or the, uh, the direct link to our webpage for the CARES Act funding, please? Will do. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to know, is our Monday mornings a good or a bad time? I'm, I'm willing to change the time if that means that, that it's easier for you to attend. Uh, I can just try a different time in case, you know, uh, people who are not on it can make it another time. Monday mornings are tough, uh, but if, if that's a good time for everyone, I'll continue that. Just let me know. Um, I really appreciate y'all joining us today. Thanks so much for, for building us into your time. Uh, as I mentioned, the recording will be available on our BLD YouTube channel. Uh, we are meeting again on August 3rd at 10 o'clock. That is a Monday morning, unless uh, we decide just to mix it up and try a different time, in which case we'll send that information out um, via Facebook, Twitter, and uh, our um, uh, web uh, constant contact. So uh, if there are no other comments or questions or things they want to, you want to share, um, we'll go ahead and log off. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. We look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. Thank you. Okay.